Well, dear friends, I invite you to turn with me to our scripture reading for today, as it is also found in the book of Psalms, Psalm 91. Again, in the Old Testament, Psalm 91. And if you are using one of our maroon Bibles, this can be found on page 512, page 512. Psalm 91, we read the entire psalm in all of its 16 verses. But friends, I draw your special attention just to verses 1 through 8, as verses 1 through 8 will constitute our text for today. Psalm 91, beginning in verse 1, let us hear then the word of the Lord. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fouler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together on this Lord's Day. Dear congregation of Jesus Christ, I must confess that as the years have gone by and I have gotten older, I've been paying more careful attention to my Social Security statement. For example, my Social Security statement indicates that it offers benefits for retirement, for disability, family, survivors, and Medicare. But on the front page of my Social Security statement, I noticed this very interesting disclaimer. And I read it for you. Listen carefully, please, as I quote. Social Security is a compact between generations. For decades, America has kept the promise of security for its workers and their families. Now, however, the Social Security system is facing serious financial problems. An action is needed soon to make sure the system will be sound when today's younger workers are ready for retirement, end of quote. In other words, friends, seemingly Social Security is not quite as secure as many of us might have hoped for, prayed for, or imagined. Ah, but be that as it may, be that as it may, by way of stark and direct contrast, As we turn our attention to the words of our text for today, as recorded for us in Psalm 91, verses 1 through 8, we find ourselves being confronted by, but also incredibly comforted by the fact that amidst all of the problems and perils and pitfalls and sorrows and sufferings and uncertainties of life, there is no greater security to be found than the security which God Himself promises to give to His people. And He gives it to us in the form and fashion of what I have termed for our purposes today, 
the security of the saints. The security of the saints. Now, friends, as we begin to consider together this theme, the security of the saints, let us notice, first of all, that our text teaches us it is rooted in a precious promise. It is rooted in a precious promise. How so? Look at verse 1 of Psalm 91 with me, if you would please. The psalmist writes, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of of the Almighty. Now let's unpack that verse a little more carefully. Look with me, please. Whoever, literally in the Hebrew, the one who or the one that, which is all inclusive. In other words, not a single one of us is accepted from this promise potentially. Whoever, notice, dwells in, dwells in. If you're taking notes, that word dwells in the Hebrew is yashab, Y-A-S-H-A-B. And yashab conveys a sense of remaining, of settling down in, of staying or abiding. Yashab, whoever dwells in. The great English preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon comments on that portion of our text this way. Listen carefully, please. Spurgeon writes, The blessings here promised are not for all believers, but for those who live in close fellowship with God. Every child of God looks towards the inner sanctuary and the mercy seat, yet all do not dwell in the most holy place. They run to it at times and enjoy occasional approaches, but they do not habitually reside in this mysterious, in His mysterious presence. End of quote. Now, friends, that reminded me, again, if you're taking notes, jot down Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Because in Luke 10, 38 through 42, we read that Mary and Martha were both in the house with Jesus, but only Mary was sitting and remaining and listening at the feet of Jesus. That same sentiment is conveyed, brothers and sisters, in John 15, verse 5, where our Lord Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains or abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that is the sense which the, which the psalmist is conveying here. Look again at verse, verse 1 of Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter, notice, of the Most High. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Now, this word shelter in the Hebrew lexicon conveys a sense of a hidden place or a hiding place, a hidden place or a hiding place. Now, for example, by way of illustration, how many of us are familiar with the name Corey Ten Boom? Let me see your hands. Corey, oh, wow, just about everybody. Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was a, a Dutch woman living in uh, the Netherlands in Holland. Uh, during the German German occupation uh, during World War II. And Corrie Ten Boom wrote a book and literally went around the world speaking about this. The book was called The Hiding Place. And uh, The Hiding Place was a place in these, uh, these Dutch homes that was perhaps behind a bookcase, hidden behind a bookcase or hidden behind a closet door or a wall or uh, perhaps underneath a, a trap door in the floor. Uh, and it was a hiding place where the, the Dutch would hide the Jews uh, from the Germans. Now, boys and girls, to help bring this home to you, you may have uh, a fort or a secret place that you like to go to, uh, maybe in your basement or somewhere in your house or out in the woods nearby. And it's kind of where you go to, to hide or, or, or be safe. And that's, that's really the idea of this word shelter. In fact, the King James Version, if I'm not mistaken, translates that portion of our our text by saying, he that dwelleth in the secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place. Now, friends, that idea is also conveyed, if you would care to turn with me, if you want to just listen, that's fine. But otherwise, go back to the left several pages to Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5. Look with me, if you care to turn, Psalm 27, Verses 4 and 5, that same idea is conveyed. The psalmist writes in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell, there's that word, yashab, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. 
For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter. Same word as is used in our text. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Now, with that information in mind, let's go back to our text. In in, uh, verse 1 of Psalm 91, we have a little more information now. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Friends, that is the first of four different names used of God in just these first two verses of our text. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High, the Hebrew word is Elyon. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest there with me in the shadow of the Almighty. Almighty is is another uh, one of God's names. It's Shaddai. It means the all-powerful one, the most powerful one. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, friends, again, this word shadow makes for a very interesting biblical study. For example, if you would care to turn, go back with me, please, to the book of Numbers, third book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, I guess that's the fourth, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Go back to the uh, early, early Old Testament. The book of Numbers, turn please, if you care to turn, to the 14th chapter. And I am going to read verses 5 through 9 of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers 14, verses 5 through 9. Here we read. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Why? They, They had scouted out the promised land. And 10 of the 12 spies says, we shouldn't go up and possess the land. There's giants there. The cities are well fortified. Uh, We can't do it. And the the leaders, Moses and Aaron, were very discouraged by all that grumbling and complaining and naysaying. Verse 6, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the only two spies who said, we can do it. And they went into the promised land. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Now notice this. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection, that is the same word used as as shadow uh, in the words of our text. It's a Hebrew word, tsel. You would transliterate it T-S-E-L. Tell, that's the word translated here, protection or shadow in our text. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Now, friends, the point that that, uh, Moses and the psalmist are making is this. Just as a shade or a shadow would protect the Israelites from the heat of the day in the promised land, so too the Lord our God is a shade or he is a shadow to his people providentially protecting us and providing for us. Now that is also conveyed in Psalm 121. If you're in the Psalms with me, let's go over just further to the right from where our scripture reading is and let's go to Psalm 121. 121. Psalm 121, a song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. Notice, the Lord is your shade. That's that word, tsel, T-S-E-L. The Lord is your shade. He's your shadow. He's your protection at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm, He will watch over, stay with me, your life. That word life in the Hebrew is the word nephesh. I believe the King James translates it as soul. Nephesh can be translated as life or soul. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life, your soul. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Friends, again, that is what our, our text is saying in a bit more succinct fashion. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. The security of the saints, first of all, is rooted in a very precious 
promise. It is rooted in a very precious promise. Well, as our text continues, secondly, we find that the security of the saints, notice, requires a personal profession. The security of the saints requires a personal profession. We'll pick it up in verse 1 and we'll go right into verse 2. Look with me, please. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2. I will say of the Lord, there's the third name of God used in these two verses. This is the name Yahweh or Yahweh. This is the name by which God introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush, boys and girls, in Exodus 3, verses 14 and 15. He said, I am who I am. That means he's the self-existent one. No beginning, no end. It's his covenant name by which he made covenant with his people. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, there's the fourth name of God in these two verses, Elohim. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now friends, just sort of prayerfully ponder silently verse 2. Look at the specific words that are used in verse 2 of Psalm 91. You know, there's a lot of talk about pronouns today, right? Everybody has to say what their pronoun is, and, and you can get sued if you don't call, <laughs> call somebody by their, their own pronoun or be fired. I mean, this is going crazy, but that's a whole message for another time. But I, I just mentioned that to you because if you look at verse 2 and think about what grammarians refer to as first-person singular pronouns, how many are there in verse 2? How many first-person singular pronouns are there in verse 2? I is one, I will say of the Lord. He is my, there's a second one, refuge, and my, there's a third one, my fortress, my God, there's four, in whom I trust. Five times, five pers- first person singular pronouns in just that one verse. What is, it, what is significant about that? What's significant about that is that the psalmist is giving here his personal testimony. He is talking about himself. He is talking about himself in relation to El Yon, the Most High, Shaddai, the Almighty, Yahweh, the Lord, and Elohim, God. He said, this is, this is my testimony. He is my God. You know, I love uh, Psalm 23, verse 1. Finish it for me. David does not say, the Lord is a shepherd. He does not say, the Lord is the shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That was David's testimony. And this is the psalmist's testimony. And my friend, it begs the question, is it your testimony? Is it your testimony today? Several years ago, I was flying from um, Chicago, O'Hare International Airport, back to Newark uh, International Airport in New Jersey. Two airports, by the way, if you can stay out of them, (laughs) you know, stay out of them. I mean, if you've ever flown through O'Hare or even Newark, uh, it's not a, a pleasant experience. But I was, I was attending a, a, a board of trustee meeting for the um, Mid-America Reformed Theological Seminary in Dyer, Indiana. I'm flying out of Chicago. I'm flying back to Newark. And uh, we all board the plane. And I'm sitting there by the window. And there's a vacant seat uh, between me and the guy on the aisle. And I'm thinking, man, it'd be nice if it stayed you know, vacant and nobody sat there for the flight. Well, right before they close the door, a uh, young Hispanic guy gets on about six feet, big mop of black curly hair. And he comes down the aisle, and I'm thinking, please, please, and plop. He, sit, he sits right next to me. So I'm like, well, now, now we're crowded in. So about a quarter of the way into the flight, uh, he takes out his laptop, and he opens it up, and he puts in an earplug. And I say to myself, oh, great, he's going to watch a movie. And he did. But as he's watching the movie, I'm kind of glancing. You know how you don't want people to know? And you're kinda, I'm kind of like looking like this. And it was a movie portraying the life of Christ. And as I'm kind of glancing over there, I see these actors uh, portraying, you know, Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem. And and then there's an actor portraying John the Baptist, you know, in the desert preaching the gospel. And and then there's, uh, you know, an actor portraying Jesus uh, preaching and, and doing his miracles and all the rest. And he's just watching this movie. All of a sudden, we go into all this turbulence. I mean, it was really bad. I usually don't get frightened on a plane. And this, I mean, the plane was dropping. Some of you have experienced that. It drops like an air pocket or something or a downdraft. It drops, it goes up. I mean, it was, and it's going. And the pilot comes over the the, uh, PA 
And he says, ladies and gentlemen, needless to say, we are hitting a great deal of turbulence. I want everybody to take their seats, uh, fasten your seatbelts uh, tight and low across your, your waist, and uh, please turn off all electronic equipment. So the guy unplugs his earphone and he, and he closes the, uh, the computer. And uh, the pilot said, it's going to be this way until we get to Newark. So uh, I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm, I'm saying, I felt like I was prompted by the spirit. And I kind of elbowed him a little bit. And he looked at me and I pointed to his computer and I said, it's all true, you know. And he said, what'd you say? And I said, it's all true. I said, Jesus is the son of God. He is the Messiah. I said, the Bible says there is no other name by which we can be saved other than by believing in the name of Jesus. And I'm waiting for a reaction. And the dear guy says, I know. I said, you know? I said, you believe that? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I said, oh, wow, that makes us brothers. And we did the brother handshake, you know, and the plane's going crazy. And we did, we did the brother handshake. And I said, wow, we're, we're brothers. He goes, yes, we are. So then he says to me, have you seen the movie? And I said, no, I've done better. I read the book. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, so have I. And he takes his knapsack out from under the seat in front of him, and he pulls out this gigantic, well-worn Bible. And he goes, I never fail to take my Bible with me, and I read it all the time. And I said, praise be to God. Well, friends, with that, he puts his Bible back in his knapsack, shoves it under the seat. He, he folds his hands, he closes his eyes, and he bows his head. He prayed. Now, the, remember what, what we're experiencing. He prayed the next hour to hour and a half all the way till we landed at Newark Airport. And I'm looking in his face. I'm looking in his face. And I said to myself, I have never seen such a look of peace and serenity on anybody's face before. And this was in the middle of a horrific storm. Now, why, how could that possibly be? Well, the reason is, is because that brother claimed that promise and had a profession that it was true for him. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and whom I trust. It was true for him. It's true for me. And my dear, dear friend, is it true for you? Is it true for you? The security of the saints is rooted in a precious promise. It requires a personal profession. And then thirdly and finally, our text teaches us that the security of the saints results in permanent protection. It results in permanent protection. Look at verse 3 of our text with me, if you would. Surely... He will save you from the fowler's snare. Now, boys and girls, do you know what a fowler is? A fowler is someone who tries to trap and kill wild birds. And the fowler's snare is what the fowler uses as a snare to try to trap and capture those birds. Now, as we apply the analogy of faith and allow Scripture to interpret Scripture on that text, turn with me to the right, please, if you would care to turn to Psalm 124. Psalm 124, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 8, where that same theme or imagery is picked up. Psalm 124, verses 6 through 8. The psalmist says, Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Similarly, let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Just go to the right to the next book of the Bible. Proverbs chapter 6. Look with me please at verse 5 if you're turning with me. Proverbs 6 verse 5. King Solomon writes, Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. And then finally on this score, keep going to the right to the book of Ecclesiastes, the next book, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 12. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 12. Here, King Solomon writes, Moreover, no one knows, yada, 
That means does not know personally, experientially, intimately. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare. So people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Now, friends, think about that. When we put all this together, if our lives or our souls are likened to a bird that needs to escape from the fowler's snare, who do you suppose the chief fowler is? Who is the ultimate fowler? Again, yep, Satan. It's Satan himself. And by the way, boys and girls, by the way, my young friends, listen carefully, please. Satan, as the fowler, does not come to us dressed in a red suit with pointed ears, a pointed tail, carrying a pitchfork saying, hi, I'm the devil. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, he comes masquerading as an angel of light, setting snares before us in the form of drugs or drink or promiscuity or pornography or sexual immorality or what the Apostle John refers to in 1 John 2, verse 16 as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. He sets these snares before us pretending that it's the real thing to give us the fulfillment, the peace, the joy, the satisfaction that we're longing for, only to find ourselves as empty as we were before it all began. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And those things are found only in a relationship with Christ. Well, friends, let's bring that information to bear back on verse 3 of our text in Psalm 91. Turn back there with me, if you would please. Psalm 91, verse 3. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. Sort of like a mother bird protecting her young. Stay with me. His faithfulness. Literally, the Hebrew word is truth, and I think the King James uses that word truth, but it's a truth that is unchanging. It is a truth that can be depended upon, and that's why the NIV translates it faithfulness. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. A rampart, by the way, has been defined as uh, any type of protective embankment or fortification, any type of embankment or fortification. And when you think of being uh, protected from, from deadly pestilence, it kind of makes you think, does it not, of the ten plagues which God brought against the land of Egypt to set His people free. And the Israelites were spared those pestilences. They were spared the ultimate tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. How, did, how were they protected? Boys and girls, do you remember they had to slay a Passover lamb and the blood was put on the door frames and the doorposts of their homes so that when the destroying angel came through the land of Egypt, he would see the blood and he would pass over that home. That's where the name Passover comes from. They were saved by the blood of the lamb. And what is the deadliest pestilence that you and I could ever face? Well, the deadliest pestilence you and I could ever face would be the holy and righteous wrath of a just and holy God with a sentence of an eternity in hell. And we too are protected from that pestilence by the blood of the Lamb, our Passover Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it takes a profession of faith in Him to have that protection. In fact, if you would care to turn with me, let's go over to the Gospel of John, uh, the third chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. In John chapter 3, verse 36, uh, John the Baptist is, uh, is teaching. And he says in John 3, 36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Friends, similarly, if you're turning with me, let's go over to Romans chapter 10, right after the book of Acts. Acts, Romans, Romans chapter 10. And drop down with me, please, if you would, in Romans 10 to verses 9 through 13. Romans 10, verses 9 through 13. The Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Romans 10, verse 9. If you declare or you profess or you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. 
For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All glory be to God. Well, let's bring that information back to bear on our text as it closes, as we draw it to a close. Let's pick it up again in verse 5. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. You know, what's so interesting about that is as God's people, we do not know the time or the type of the foes we will ever face. And the scriptures kind of cover it all for us. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. A magnificent display of the mercy of God made manifest to us. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. A magnificent display of the judgment and the justice of God. The security of the saints, my dear friends in the Lord, results in permanent protection. It results in permanent protection. Well, I close with this. Several years ago, I read a newspaper account of an art exhibit that was held uh, in New York City. It was kind of a contest, an art, art contest. And the theme of that art exhibit was the theme of peace, peace. According to the article, according to the article, as you might have suspected, the art exhibit was filled with peaceful landscapes. Lush rolling hillsides, sailboats sailing placidly on a lake, bucolic farm scenes, animals, all the rest. The article said that the painting, surprisingly enough, that got first place, took first prize, was a painting of a violent ocean storm with these waves crashing against the shoreline the wind whipping up the waves uh, in the midst of the ocean and dark, menacing, billowing clouds overhead. First prize, peace. And the article said that the attendees thought that the judges just made a horrible mistake. Why in the world would that painting win first prize with the theme of peace? Until you looked very, very closely at the painting. And then the article said you would see what the judges saw. If you looked real closely at that stormy, violent scene, and you looked up along the the rocky cliff that bordered, bordered the shoreline, and you looked real closely into a little crevice in the rock, you could barely make out a mother bird safely sheltering her young. Think about that. Peace. First prize. Question. In the midst of the storms of life, in the midst of the sorrows, in the sufferings, in the problems, in the pains, and the uncertainties, of this world, are you experiencing that kind of peace? My friend, if you are not, if you came in here to worship today and know nothing about that kind of peace in the midst of life storms, then by the grace and mercy of God before you leave here today, Claim this precious promise that is recorded in God's Word by means of a personal profession. Because just as was true for the psalmist, it will be true for you. You and I will experience that same kind of permanent protection. And we will be able to go out into all of the unknowns and uncertainties of this new week and this new year with the comfort and the confidence and the courage which comes by means of the security 
of the saints. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer together. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. O oh, our mighty God and most merciful Heavenly Father, by Your grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. May these words of the psalmist which we have considered oh so carefully together today also be the personal testimony of each and every one of us as well. So that we might all be able to live and die with our only comfort, with the joy, the peace, the comfort, and the courage of the security of the saints. Hear us, O faithful Heavenly Father, we pray and we plead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.